This morning we are going to be looking into Matthew's Gospel initially, and uh, I draw your attention to the 10th chapter of Matthew. We begin reading at verse 40, uh, verse 40, and through the rest of that chapter, in just a few short verses, we'll finish at the end of that chapter, which is verse 42, so it gives you some idea of where it is. As we began the service this morning, we, uh, we made reference to the fact that it had been our desire and hope to be able to invite everybody to come back uh, in mass, to come back and give an announcement day, thus it begins afresh and anew, welcome to the Lord's house. Well, we say welcome to the Lord's house wherever you are, Amen. because as we point out, the, where the people of God are, that is where the presence of God Amen. is. Amen. And so uh, wherever you are, you are in the Lord's house. Amen. And uh, let us enjoy the blessings of the Lord. We've enjoyed singing together, but let's also anticipate that there will be a day coming before a whole lot longer, we hope and we pray, when uh, we will be able to gather uh, in the sanctuary that we have been, been accustomed to. We uh, will continue to broadcast uh, out there because, as we mentioned before, the uh, whole issue of, of vulnerabilities are going to be uh, before us for some time. And even though when we come together and begin to have people choosing to come in and worship with us in the, in the sanctuary, it will be necessary for us to do the appropriate social uh, distancing and the wearing of masks and, and uh, will be an essential part of that. And, and uh, so we ask you to be mindful of those things when you come. The, the reality is we are already ready for you to come now. Uh, we've had folks who have come to the church and uh, for a couple of different sessions and uh, do cleaning and, and disinfecting and uh, uh, taking care of everything so that it would make it uh, safer for you to come when you make that choice. You're not under pressure. We're not putting your arm behind your back and trying to force you to do something. But when the time comes that you feel that you're comfortable in returning to the Lord's house, we're going to be here. And you may come and, and join us as we will gather together and celebrate the Lord's presence with us in those times. Now, back to the uh, lesson of the morning in the scripture, uh, Matthew's Gospel, chapter 10. We read these words. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of the prophet shall receive the prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man shall receive a righteous man's reward. And whoever, whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, surely I say to you, he shall, he shall not lose his reward. Have you ever wondered where that little saying that we've uh, used many, many times, getting a cup of cold water in Jesus' name? Have you been known to say that or think that in the, in the past when somebody maybe gave you uh, some, some refreshment of some kind, whether it's a, a, a cup of water or a bottle of water or a can of uh, soda or whatever it may be, that you receive that from the person who is gracing you by giving it to you uh, in that regard? This passage of scripture is a very, very positive indicator that this is a valid thing to do. And this is the kind of thing that we, that we as the followers of Christ need to be mindful of, providing something in the form of a hospitality to those that uh, we have opportunity to have ministry to like that. Um, this passage of scripture uh, is, is a New Testament position here uh, on that subject and the admonition that is there, but there are throughout the scriptures repeated places where, where uh, the whole question of hospitality is demonstrated and we are called to do that. And uh, I'll ask you to, to flip back here in the Old Testament with me. Uh, where did I put it? That's not where I'm going. Let's don't do that. <laughs> uh, let me just simply say to you that uh, throughout scripture that these these hospitality issues come up they happen in uh, first kings the 17th chapter uh, we have there the the information that is shared with us about elijah 
And Elijah had uh, gone before King Ahab, and King Ahab was probably not the, the most uh, cooperative person to work with. And in fact, the scripture said that he was a pretty mean character, and he was meaner than even his father. So that's not a good, a good uh, thing to have said about you, but uh, he was a pretty rough kind of a guy to deal with. Well, uh, Elijah had gone before him to be, in fact, what his calling was, to prophesy to him that a drought was coming and that, uh, that uh, this was going to be the, the verdict, this was going to be the indictment that was going to be upon the land because of, of all the things that, that uh, uh, the, the, uh, the king was, was doing that was so wrong and har harmful. And uh, once he had delivered that message, he was one scared prophet. Now, there have been times that I've known other pre people, other individuals, and even other preachers who have who have given very specific uh, the instructions that was not well received. They've been trying to talk to people about some of the evils that are going on in their personal world, trying to encourage them to address those evils. And having done that, then they were kind of persona non grata. Basically, their, their presence was no longer desired. And uh, they needed to kind of uh, exit the stage as quickly as possible for fear of their own lives. And this is exactly what happened with Elijah. And Elijah took off and went, and went down into the distance. And there he was cared for by the brook where God made it possible that the, the ravens would come and bring food to him. And there was water in abundance to him in that brook where he would be able to, to be nourished and cared for. As time went on and the ravages of the drought began to take place as it lays it out for us there in chapter 17 of 1 Kings that the, the brook soon dried up. And when the brook dried up, he was, a, he was a prophet with a problem because he then too was in the same situation that everybody else in the land was. Food was not readily available and water was not available to him as well. And so he was directed to, that he should go uh, in search of, uh, of a widow. Or, in fact, he went to a place called Zarephath. And there in Zarephath, he encountered a widow woman who with her son were gathering sticks in that little, in that situ, in that place. They were gathering sticks. And as Elijah began to talk to her, uh, she let it be known to him uh, that, uh, that this was the last meal that they were going to have before they died. Because the cupboard was bare, the, uh, the, the meal, the, the grain was, was finished. This was the last little scraps that she had been able to put together. And in that setting, Elijah says to her, well, I'm going to ask you to take care of me too. I'm going to ask you to feed me. And I'm believing that God is going to provide for you in the midst of doing that. So she followed the directions and the instructions that Elijah gave her. And she went and, and made a cake of bread uh, with the, the meager ingredients that she still had left. And she served it to him and he, he had food to eat. And there was also now enough for, his, for her to make another cake for her son and herself. And for an extended period of time, this was the situation. Every time he, he actually became the guest of them. And they became his principal source, uh, his principal uh, source of nourishment. And uh, she continually took care of him. She extended hospitality, hospitality to him, and provided food for him to to eat. And uh, it's amazing how, when we are generous with what God has entrusted to us that God will not only take care of the things that he instructs us to do with those, but he'll also take care of us in the process of that. We, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, we have uh, many symbols that in our days, many of you can remember various times in history when various symbols were used to indicate where, where God's people could be found or where hospitality would be made available to you. And I happen to bring a a, uh, uh, a prop with me this morning, and so I'm going to bring it out. Does anybody recognize what this is? <laughs> I can't hear you. <laughs> it's a pineapple. Yes, I knew you were trying to say that, and maybe you at home were saying that. This is a pineapple. The pineapple has become a symbol of hospitality. 
Many places that you go to, you'll find either a fountain out in the front bubbling away, and on the very top of the fountain, the water is bubbling out of the top of the, of the pineapple, and uh, it is a symbol of hospitality in those places. The stories go that uh, in the earlier days of, of uh, uh, the, the church, and not just the church, but in the early days in, in this country, as well as in other places in the world, when, when the popularity of a pineapple began to catch on all over the world, the, the pineapple was the symbol of hospitality that was there. The scriptures, as I mentioned to you uh, a few moments ago, are, are filled with expressions of issues of hospitality. And uh, in, in our country here, in the early days of the, uh, of the church, uh, it was not unusual for there to be something that was called a circuit riding preacher. Uh, and just in case you don't know what a circuit riding preacher was, when congregations were, were far flung, they were all over the place and not enough pastors or preachers to care for them, uh, there were circuit riders. And uh, they had a, a ministry circuit and they would go from town to town where there were churches and where there was a collection of faith believing people where the minister would go and meet with them and give them the word of God, pray with them and take care of, of them on a spiritual plane. But his responsibility was to share and take care of them. They had responsibility to look after the preacher at the same time. In those days, the preacher's uh, support came in a variety of ways. It may be a, a, a dozen eggs, it may be a, a chicken, and those chickens were usually alive when they were given to the preacher. Uh, and these were, were just a few of the, of the ways that uh, the pastors were taken care of in those early, early days of the circuit riding preachers. But when they came to town, they needed a place to stay. And sometimes the people uh, were forethinking enough, some of the individuals within a church were, were enough, uh, had enough forethought that when they built their houses, uh, they would always provide what they call a prophet's chamber, a prophet's chamber. And a prophet's chamber was in fact a room in the house that was saved and set apart for when the preacher, the circuit riding preacher came, that there would be a place for him to stay. And he would come and, and uh, if he was new to the town, he would, he would ask the question, is there anybody here of this fellowship who has a prophet's chamber? And uh, those people who were able to do it would grace him by giving him a place to stay and say, yes, I have a prophet's chamber at my house. Preacher, you come and you stay at my house while you're ministering to our people here in this particular community. And so they would go, and while they were there, this was their place to stay and take care of the people in the community ministering to them. It's kind of interesting how that all plays out, though. Because uh, oftentimes when the preacher got ready to leave, not only had he been cared for by the people, by these people with the prophet's chamber, and not only had he been caring for the people of the church, but now it was his turn to give a special blessing to the, to the accommodation that he had stayed at. And the people actually who were providing the prophet's chamber looked forward to the blessing that they were going to receive from the prophet who had been ministering, the preacher who had been ministering to them, uh, would receive a blessing from him before he left and went on his way to his next assignment. Um, with the passage of time, keeping in mind the symbol that this pineapple represented, there have been times when it became more than just a symbol for the preachers. In fact, it is almost an international symbol anymore. But in some situations, people have been known to outstay their welcome. Has that ever happened in your family? That whether it's a relative or some contact that you have, they have come and taken advantage of your hospitality. They've come and stayed with you for a period of time. And you begin to scratch your head and wonder, well, I wonder how much longer they're going to stay before they move on and go to someplace else. They've been here several weeks already, and it's time for changes to come. So what would, how do we tell them? How can we be gracious to them and, and say to them with some symbol that it's time for you to move on? <laughs> the beds, oftentimes in the prophet's chamber and in the guest rooms, were what you call a four-poster bed. 
and that meant that there were four posts, both posts on each corner of the bed. Uh, we don't see many of those kinds of beds these days, but they're still around. But the finials that sit on top of those posts on those beds, oftentimes, it is for hospitality purposes, have the symbol of a pineapple on top of it, usually carved of wood, and it sits atop each of those four posts. So if you were taking advantage of the hospitality that was offered to you in the prophet's chamber, and you had been out and about, and you came back after having been there for a while, and you take notice of the fact that one of the four pineapples on top of the bedpost is missing, that's your first clue. Somebody's taken notice of the fact that you've been here too long, and it's time for you to move on. If you don't pay attention to that, you'll come back a day or two later and you'll find out that now there are two pineapples missing off the top of the finials uh, in those bed, on the, the uh, poster bed. So those are indicators, those are, those are pieces of information that it's time to move on. But all around the world, people have used various symbols to, to demonstrate what hospitality is like. We understand the symbol of the pineapple. In Asia, they usually use the symbol of a frog. And somewhere near the entrance of a house or a place, there will be a frog in the garden, a frog. And a frog is for them the symbol of hospitality, saying that you'll be welcome. If you're really going to be welcome, there'll be two frogs out there. But uh, normally it's just one frog saying, this is a place that you'll be welcome at. Um, and we've talked about the, uh, the uh, pineapple in Western cultures. Um, but uh, in the Arab country cultures, they use a little bit different model. When they are serving you uh, your coffee, uh, they, if, if you have been there long enough and it's time for you to move on, it is said, I've not had this experience, but the research says this is often done. They fill your cup to overflowing. And so when you're having your cup filled, if it's time for you to move on, they'll fill it so that it just overflows. And that's your symbol. You've been here long enough. You've had too much. It's time to, to move on like that. Uh, the uh, further scriptures also help us talk about this as well. Um, in the book of Acts, the uh, 10th chapter of the book of Acts, we have the story of the situation relative to Cornelius. Cornelius was, uh, was a soldier, a ranking soldier, and he lived in a place called Caesarea. And uh, he was a man of faith, and he, he utilized his home to minister to, to other people, and he was sharing his faith. And he had a visitation from a spiritual being, an angel who talked to him and, and instructed him that it's time for him to, to uh, bring in some reinforcements. And so he was told that, uh, that Peter was, Simon, uh, Peter was over in Joppa. And that he should send the messengers over to Joppa in order to invite Peter, Simon Peter, to come to his house. Uh, because there were people there that needed to hear the message. People that needed to hear from, from Peter. And so he dispatched a, a several men. having He brought them in and explained to them the nature of their task and their role was to go and make the announcement to Simon Peter that there was need of him elsewhere and that there would be a place for him to stay when he came. And so they went to uh, another Simon's house, Simon the Tanner, who lived down by the seashore. It's a marvelous place to stay. I wonder why Peter was there in the first place. Maybe he was taking a little bit of a break, a little holiday there on the seashore and uh, enjoying his time at Simon the Tanner's place before the message came to come to Caesarea. No, that doesn't really work too well because Caesarea was also a sea town as well in those days. And so he still had the opportunity to keep enjoying the presence being near the ocean and near the water, in this case the Mediterranean Sea. And so these uh, men went to, to, to uh, Simon the Tanner's house and, and asked of uh, Peter, is Peter here? Or Simon Peter, also known as, as uh, Peter, for uh, Cornelius has need of him and invites him to come to his house and allow him to take hospitality. And so uh, a couple of days later, it's only about 35 miles between uh, Joppa and Caesarea. And so it took, it took a serious walk for them to, uh, to get back to there. So a day or so later, they arrived back in, in Cornelius's house there in Caesarea. 
where he was welcomed with, uh, with open arms and uh, was invited then to begin to do just what the circuit riding preachers did, to proclaim the word of God. And in that next uh, section of uh, the latter portion of the 10th chapter, we see where Peter, under the anointing of God's Holy Spirit, begins to talk with power to people, and, and there were added to the church in those days because of the power of God in his life and what God was doing through him that was ministering to those people that they were coming to faith. You know, there's something uniquely special about the privilege of extending hospitality. When we extend hospitality to people, whether it's people who are going to stay in our home or people that we're giving hospitality to in the community, uh, whatever it may be, it is a means by which we are sharing with them Christ. The passage of scripture that we read to you at the very beginning of this service talked about getting a cup of water. That passage of scripture gives credence and gives strength to the very things that we're talking about here. Because when we do those things, we extend hospitality, we do it in Jesus' name. And many people, many times people, the first experience, the first expression that they know or see about Jesus Christ is the expression of hospitality that is given to them in Jesus' name. And so this morning, as we are seeing so many things that are happening and so many reasons in our community where there's divisions and fears that are out there for a variety of reasons, it gives us cause. It gives the body of Christ cause to extend hospitality in meaningful ways. It doesn't necessarily mean that you buy into the political ramifications and the rhetoric that's a part of that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about extending hospitality that are expressions of the love language of Jesus Christ. Speaking into their lives and letting them know that Jesus loves them. And if Jesus loves them, I love you too. May not agree with you in everything, but I still love you. And that's true with us as well. You've probably experienced that in your own families. You're going to experience that in, in the church along with the journey of faith that we share together. We, uh, we may not always agree, but we can learn to disagree in an agreeable fashion. And that's an acceptable way of conducting ourselves. And we do it in Jesus' name. Because who are we honoring? Who is the Lord and the Savior of our life? Who is the one on whom we find our, our life and our strength? It's found in Jesus. And so this week, as we go forth, extending hospitality, I pray that we will each one Remember that this is the cup of water that we give in Jesus' name. And believing that in this illustration, in this way, that we are going to give a witness and a testimony that hopefully, prayerfully, will mean their salvation in the days ahead. That God may give us the opportunity to be the agents of grace to them in a world that is so, so hungry for expressions of grace and love. Father, we thank you this morning for your word, for the uh, truth that it extends to us in powerful, powerful ways. In many ways that we are literally becoming the host of heaven as we share these things with uh, these expressions of love with the world that needs them. We ask, us, we ask you, Lord, to enable us to be more like you in every way, that you might equip us with the necessary means by which we can give and share and uh, be a blessing to others. And when people do come into our home, let us not leave them without the grace, without the blessing that we share with them. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and may God bless you abundantly. Amen. Amen. Have a blessed week. God bless you. Yeah.